Dr. Marion Nessel, you know, Forbes magazine has said that you're one of the most important foodies in the world. I love that. I would imagine <laughs> so. <laughs> but how do you characterize what you do for employment or, or generation of income? Um, like, what's your job? Well, I'm retired now, but I retired. Well, it doesn't look like you're retired to me. <laughs> well, I retired as a university professor. University professors teach students, do research, and do public service. Right. That's what I did. That was my I had a standard, well, maybe not completely standard, but a pretty standard academic career, particularly towards the end. Okay, but for somebody who's retired, you told me, I got to take a red eye out of here because I'm on <laughs> schedule to do all these other things. So what are the things that you're doing now? Well, I'm, I've kept my office. Um, I had a very soft retirement. The main difference is I'm no longer being paid. But I'm still giving lectures when I'm invited to give lectures in various places. And a lot of people held off during the pandemic. And now the invitations are starting to come in again. And I do like doing them. So I say yes. You're also writing, aren't you? Yes, I'm working on a revision of my book, What to Eat, of, which came out in 2006. Uh, during the memoir, I published a, during the pandemic, I published a memoir. Um, I like having a book project. I always like having a book project. The one I'm working on now, I'm in year three, mm -hmm. and it's scheduled for publication in March 2000. 2025. So you got a year and a half. I've got a year and a half. Oh. And so that keeps you engaged. It does. You're also doing interviews. Uh, you're well, traveling. Here, here and, I am. Yeah. So yeah. you still have a very busy career. But to be in this position where uh, you're a retired professor, you're an author, you're a lecturer, the only reason that you're able to continue to enjoy and contribute the way that you did is because of the quality of the career that you had before. You started your uh, academic pursuits at Berkeley University. What were you studying and where did you go from there? I was an undergraduate and a doctoral student at Berkeley and then later, 20 years later, came back for a master's degree also from Berkeley. Um, I was an undergraduate science major. Mm -hmm. the, I, I started Berkeley wanting to study about food. Interesting, you know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. interesting to think about that. There were only two possibilities. There was agriculture and there was dietetics. Agriculture was out of the question. I was a city girl. I didn't get agriculture at all. You know, not until many, many, many years later did I understand how important understanding how our agricultural system is to understanding why people eat the way they do. Um, and dietetics was too much like home economics. I think I lasted as a dietetics major for one day. And then uh, because we were assigned to all of these science classes, I really liked those. I was taking classes with Drew medical students and liked it. So um, I ended up as a bacteriology major, and then I worked uh, for a couple of years, and then I dropped out to have children. I was married at the time, um, and came back to graduate school in molecular biology mm -hmm. because my favorite professor as an undergraduate was in that department, and I thought if he was in that department, it must be the most exciting place to be in the university. Uh, and so that's what I did. I got a degree in molecular biology and then did a postdoctoral fellowship in developmental biology and then took a teaching job hmm. and taught cell and molecular biology until I was handed a nutrition class to teach. Why? What happened there in that class? Um, I fell in love. With? With nutrition. Okay. Well, you, know, you might it, have fallen in love with someone else. Yeah, <laughs> no. It was, it was the most amazing experience. I mean, I liked science, and it was very hard for me. And I didn't understand. I never understood until 
nutrition that if you're good if you if things are easy for you <laughs> it may have something to do with the fact that you really like them and are a good fit with them and i was handed this nutrition to class to teach and i could immediately see that it was going to be a wonderful way to teach undergraduate biology mm -hmm. because if you're teaching cell and molecular biology the students can't taste it they can't see it they can't smell it they can't touch it they have to infer it yeah. um, and it's a very intellectual pr pursuit it's abstract but food Nutrition, everybody eats, everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. And I could see that by talking about the chemistry of food, the way we digest food, um, how it's handled in the body, that we were gonna be able to cover a lot of basic biological concepts through nutrition. And the students wouldn't even know that, that these things were happening. Mm -hmm. They would just be fascinated by it. And of course, that's exactly what happened. How long did you do that? I did that one year. Oh, <laughs> one year. But it then um, it, it then put a you you oh, arrived at a new intersection. Oh, it took you absolutely. in a different, dire a different direction. Yeah. What yeah. happened in that first class was that uh, I had a class of about fifty students, and the class liked it so much that they asked if I would teach a more advanced one. Mm -hmm. And so the next semester, I taught a more advanced one. And what I was having the students do was to read. Um, papers in, I mean, that was the other thing that was so exciting about it was that you couldn't give original papers in molecular biology to undergraduate students without an enormous amount of work because they couldn't understand the language and they didn't understand the methods. But food, you could give a, a nutrition study Mm -hmm. to undergraduate students and they could take one look at it and say, but there were only six subjects. You know, and my favorite study that I was teaching during that time was a study of vitamin C deficiency. And during the study, two, it was done on prisoners in a state penitentiary. And during the study, uh, two of the six prisoners escaped. Oh. And that was not a well-controlled clinical trial. You know, anybody could see that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was wonderful to be able to teach these basic biological concepts using food as a way to do that. And then at the sort of in the middle of that year, my husband of the time mm -hmm. um, got a job offer in San Francisco. And so we left at the end of that year. And I was hired at the University of California, San Francisco, the medical school to teach uh, nutrition to medical students. Wow. So that was, and that was the career. That's what really started it. Mm -hmm. And it's taken you to some extraordinary uh, locations, you know, insights. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I moved from, I'm, I'm really changed. I mean, I started out in science. I moved from that to nutrition. I moved from nutrition to food and then from food to food systems. Mm -hmm. So this is a long trajectory over a very long period of time. Yeah. So what do you think was the most important element of your personality that gave you the uh, intellectual and curiosity flexibility to pursue these different iterations along the lines of biology, molecular biology. You know, I think it was curiosity. I yeah. just really wanted to know the way things worked. You know, what I loved about molecular biology was that this is how life works. Mm. DNA, RNA, protein. Um, and it's, this was the way, I, I wanted to know how it worked. And I think I brought that same curiosity to nutrition studies. Um, okay, how did they do this experiment? Really? There were only six subjects in that trial? Mm -hmm. And really, there was no control group? And really, they didn't do any statistics? Uh, you know, it was that kind of thing. Um, and it was that sort of basic, or maybe a basic, I think I was someone who was born skeptical. Mm. <laughs> you know? I'm constitutively skeptical. Um, and so I wanted to find out what the facts were. I was uh, in a search for, I mean, this sounds so pretentious, a search for truth, I don't know, curious. 
Well, it's about gathering one little bit of information saying, oh, that's interesting. And hang on, how did that work there? And then go on, check that mm -hmm. out. And then the next one. Like, well, the bit that you got now wasn't enough. You needed to go and find more. Well, you know, this mm -hmm. was partly the molecular biology training. Yeah. Uh, I, the training program, to me, it was just the right, in, in a way, it was the right kind of training for me because what we had beaten into us as graduate students in that Berkeley program was that you never believe the surface of a scientific study. You have to read the references and see if the references match what the study authors said about it. And then that's not enough. You have to read the references to those references. And you have to go back and read the references until you're not learning anything new. Mm -hmm. And that kind of training, I don't know if anybody does that anymore, um, was, uh, you know, I, I brought that into nutrition. And I remember that there was a, a study, there, there was a sort of a common thing that was being said about vitamin C in those years, that if you ate a lot of vitamin C, Linus Pauling, a Nobel Prize winner, was saying that 10 gram, everybody should eat 10 grams a day of vitamin C. It would prevent cancer, would prevent the common cold, um, would make you live forever. And there, was a, there were studies that said that if you ate a lot of vitamin C that there, and then stopped, you would get rebound scurvy. Scurvy is the disease that you get when you don't have enough vitamin C. And so I took one of the things that said that and read the references, and then I went back and read the references and kept doing that until I discovered that the original study had been done on one rabbit um, and didn't say anything at all about rebound scurvy. So it was that kind of training, and mm -hmm. then my, I think, appreciation, acceptance of that training and understanding that that training was very useful, that was that made me unusual in my approach to nutrition. I didn't come through a standard nutrition training program. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the strength of the science background was something that made my approach to it a little bit different from everybody else's. And it led to a wonderful career. It did indeed. Thank you.